This is chapter 15 of Jane Eyre. Mr. Rochester did, on a future occasion, explain it. The it is what he mentioned at the very end of chapter 14. So he starts to talk about how Adele is like a blossom and the root of the blossom he doesn't care about as much as the blossom itself and how she's also meant to expiate or make up for something wrong or perhaps many wrongs that he's done in the past. So he's going to explain some of that um, odd metaphor now. It was one afternoon when he chanced to meet me and Adele in the grounds, and while she played with Pilot and her shuttlecock, he asked me to walk up and down along Beach Avenue within sight of her. He then said that she was the daughter of a French opera dancer, Celine Varens, towards whom he had once cherished what he called a grand passion, which just means a great passion in French. This passion Celine had professed to return with even superior ardor. He thought himself her idol, ugly as he was. He believed, as he said, that she preferred his tall athlete to the elegance of the Apollo Belvedere, um, and that just means his athletic build. And Miss Eyre, so much was I flattered by this preference of the Gallic sylph for her British gnome that I installed her in a hotel, gave her a complete establishment of servants, a carriage, cashmeres, diamonds, dentelles, etc. In short, I began the process of ruining myself in the received style, like any other spoony. I had not, it seems, the originality to chalk out a new road to shame and destruction, but trod the old track with stupid exactness not to deviate an inch from the beaten center. I had, as I deserved to have, the fate of all other spoonies. Happening to call one evening when Celine did not expect me, I found her out. But it was a warm night, and I was tired with strolling through Paris, so I sat down in her boudoir, happy to breathe the air consecrated so lately by her presence. No, I exaggerate. I never thought there was any consecrating virtue about her. It was rather a sort of pastel perfume she had left, a scent of musk and amber, than an odor of sanctity. I was just beginning to stifle with the fumes of conservatory flowers and sprinkled essences when I bethought myself to open the window and step out onto the balcony. It was moonlight and gaslight besides, and very still and serene. The balcony was furnished with a chair or two. I sat down and took a cigar. I will take one now, if you excuse me. If you will excuse me. So, Mr. Rochester and the Celine lady were having an affair. Um, Victorians would have considered any, like, physical relationship outside of marriage to be an affair. So, he and Celine Varens are, are dating, and they're pretty serious, and he goes to visit her. Uh, he puts her in a hotel and starts spoiling her with all these nice things, gives her a carriage, um, gives her some servants, uh, nice clothes, some jewels, all this good stuff. So he, he sets her up in this hotel room and he goes to visit her. He finds that she's out, so he goes in to wait for her because he's paid for this room anyway. Here ensued a pause, filled up by the producing and lighting of a cigar. Having placed it to his lips and breathed the trail of Havana incense on the freezing and sunless air, he went on. I liked bonbons too in those days, Miss Eyre, and I was croquant. Um, and that means... Munching. <laughs> overlook the barbarism um croquant chocolate comfits munching on chocolate candy of some variety and smoking alternately watching meantime the equipages that rolled along the fashionable streets toward the neighboring opera house when in an elegant close carriage drawn by a beautiful pair of english horses and distinctly seen in the brilliant um in the brilliant city night i recognized the voiture i had given celine the carriage that he had given celine she was returning. Of course, my heart thumped with impatience against the iron rails I leaned upon. The carriage stopped, as I had expected, at the hotel door. My flame, that is the very word for an opera inamorata, alighted. Um, notice, too, that so an inamorata is someone that you're in love with or someone who's in love with you. Um, and notice, too, how even Mr. Rochester is using some fire imagery to talk about love, uh, intense emotion and passion. Alighted. Though muffled in a cloak, an unnecessary encumbrance, by the by, on so warm a June evening, I knew her instantly by her little foot, seen peeping from the skirt of her dress as she skipped from carriage to step, from the carriage step. Bending over the balcony, I was about to murmur, Mon Ange, uh, which is my angel, in a tone, of course, which should be audible to the ear of love alone, when a figure jumped from the carriage after her, cloaked also, but that was a spurred heel which had rung on the pavement, and that was a hatted head which now passed under the arch, arched porte corchere of the hotel, uh, which just means the gate of the hotel. 
You never felt jealousy, did you, Miss Eyre? Of course not. I need not ask you because you never felt love. You have both sentiments yet to experience. Your soul sleeps. The shock is yet to be given, which shall waken it. You think all existence lapses in as quiet a flow as that in which your youth has hitherto slid away. Just a, just a side note, he's saying a lot of things about, you know, what, what Jane's experienced and what she hasn't been through. Um, and he doesn't really know her whole past and, and backstory. So we know that she's gone through quite a great deal um, being in a family that was neglectful and abusive towards her, living in horrible uh, conditions at Lowood School. And uh, we know that she's been through some intense emotions and sufferings. So it's a little a little frustrating, um, at least to me reading it, that he, he so discounts what she's experienced in the past, although she hasn't um, lived as long as he has or traveled all over the world. All right, well, you have both sentiments yet to experience. Your soul sleeps, a shock is yet to be given, which will awaken it. You think all existence lapses in as quiet a flow as that in which your youth has hitherto slid away. Um, and that was what bothered me, because her youth was not really quiet. She lost her best friend when she was pretty young. Um, she's, she's been through a lot. Floating on with closed eyes and muffled ears, you neither see the rocks bristling not far off in the bed of the flood, nor hear the breakers boil at their base. But I tell you, and you may mark my words, you will someday, uh, you will come someday to a craggy pass in the channel, where the whole of life's stream will be broken up into whirl and tumult, foam and noise. Either you will be dashed to atoms on crag points, or lifted up and borne on by some master wave into a calmer current, as I am now. I like this day. I like that sky of steel. I like the sternness and stillness of the world under this frost. I like Thornfield, its antiquity, its retirement, its old crow trees and thorn trees, its gray facade, and lines of dark windows reflecting that metal welkin. And yet, how long have I abhorred the very thought of it, shunned it like a great plague house? How I do still abhor... He ground his teeth and was silent. He arrested his step and struck his boot against the hard ground. Some hated thought seemed to have him in its grip, and to hold him so tightly that he could not advance. So then he kind of stops his flashback um, with uh, with Celine Varens and their whole uh, affair. He's um, he's jealous because some guy gets out of a carriage with her. Um, so that's uh, that's pretty scandalous. So he's. Uh, just realized in the flashback that he's been two time um, by Celine Varens. So then he he stops talking and he starts looking at Thornfield and he says, "I like Thornfield. I like um, how old it is. I like the surroundings of it, but I've hated it for a really long time." And then he stops walking and then he kind of like grinds his foot into the ground and he seems very angry and upset about something. We were ascending the avenue when he thus paused. The hall was before us. Lifting his eye to its battlements, he cast over them a glare such as I never saw before or since. Pain, shame, ire, impatience, disgust, detestation seemed momentarily to hold a quivering conflict in the large pupil dilating under his ebon eyebrow. Wild was the wrestle which should be paramount. But another feeling rose and triumphed, something hard and cynical, self-willed and resolute. It settled his passion and petrified his countenance. He went on. During the moment I was silent, Miss Eyre, I was arranging a point with my destiny. She stood there by that beech trunk, a hag like one of those who appeared to Macbeth on the heath of fours. You like Thornfield, she said, lifting her finger, and then she wrote in the air a memento which ran in lurid hieroglyphics all along the house front, between the upper and low lower row of windows. Like it if you can, like it if you dare. I will like it, I said I. I dare like it. And, he subjoined moodily, I will keep my word. I will break obstacles to happiness, to goodness. Yes, goodness. I wish to be a better man than I have been, than I am. As, jo as Job's Leviathan broke the spear, the dart, the ha the ha and the haberdashon, hindrances which others count as iron and brass, I will esteem but straw and rotten wood. So then he starts looking at Thornfield, and then he goes into this weird metaphor again. He's he's a big fan of weird metaphors. Uh, he, he says, oh, it was as if there were an old hag witch woman who said, oh, you really like Thornfield, don't you like it if you dare? And then he says, yes, I will like Thornfield, and I'm going to overcome all of these obstacles that other people would think are um, unbreakable and bound to stop me from doing what I want, but I'm going to overcome them as if they were nothing. Adele here ran before him with her shuttlecock. Away, he cried harshly. Keep at a distance, child, or go in to Sophie. Continuing then to pursue his walk in silence, 
I ventured to recall him to the point whence he had abruptly diverged. Did you leave the balcony, sir? I asked, when Mademoiselle Varens entered. I almost expected a rebuff for this hardly well-timed question, but, on the contrary, walk waking out of his scowling abstraction, he turned his eyes towards me, and the shade seemed to clear off his brow. Oh, I had forgotten, Celine. Well, to resume, when I saw my charmer thus come in accompanied by a cavalier, I seemed to hear a hiss, and the green snake of jealousy, rising on undulating coils from the moonlit balcony, glided within my waistcoat, neighed its way in two minutes to my heart's core. Um... So there he goes again with his weird metaphors. He says, then he saw Celine go into the hotel room with this other guy, um, again, realizing that she's cheating on him, um, even though they're really not having, you know, what Victorians would consider a, a sanctioned or allowed uh, romance. So she, she's, he sees that she, he's being cheated on, and then the snake of jealousy rears its ugly head. Strange, he exclaimed, suddenly starting again from the point. Strange that I should choose you for the confidant of all this, young lady. Passing strange that you should listen to me quietly, as if it were the most as, as if as if it were the most usual thing in the world for a man like me to tell stories of his opera mistresses to a quaint, inexperienced girl like you. But the last singularity explains the first, as I intimated once before. You, with your gravity, considerateness, and caution, were made to be the recipient of secrets. Besides, I know what sort of a mind I have placed in communication with my own. I know it is not, uh, I know it is one not liable to take infection. It is a peculiar mind. It is a unique one. Happily, I do not mean to harm it, but if I did, it would not take harm from me. The more you and I converse, the better, for while I cannot blight you, you may refresh me. So then he says, um, it's weird that I'm telling you all of these things because you really haven't done anything as scandalous or as wrong as this, but then it does make sense because uh, Jane seems to be someone who can listen to others without judging them very much. Um, and he he says that if even if he's going to tell her some scandalous things that she won't um, won't fall under a bad influence and she's probably a good influence on him instead. After this digression, he proceeded. I remained in the balcony. They will come to a boudoir, no doubt, thought I. Let me prepare an ambush. So, putting my hand in through the open window, I drew the curtain over it, leaving only an opening through which I could take observations. Then I closed the casement, all but a chink just wide enough to furnish an outlet to lovers' whispered vows. Then I stole back to my chair, and as I resumed it, the pair came in. So Mr. Rochester's now hiding in the hotel room to, to, catch, them in, um, to catch them cheating, basically. My eye was quickly at the aperture. Celine's chambermaid entered, lit a lamp, left it on the table, and withdrew. The couple were thus revealed to me clearly. Both removed their cloaks, and there was the Varens, shining in satin and jewels, my guess, of course. And there was her companion in an officer's uniform. And I knew him for a young Rue of a Vicomte. Um, oh, I don't know. I don't have the translation for Rue. I'll have to find out. Um, but a Viscount is someone, uh, in English, should be a, a, a Viscount, so uh, someone who would be a pretty high-ranking noble. A brainless and vicious youth whom I had sometimes met in society, and had never thought of hating because I despised him so absolutely. Such a good insult. Um, Mr. Rochester never thought of hating this guy because he just really doesn't like him. So he doesn't like him so much that he's beneath his, his notice and not even worth the effort of hating. On recognizing him, the fang of the snake jealousy was instantly broken, because at that same moment my love for Celine sank under an extinguisher. A woman who could betray me for such a rival was not worth contending for. She deserved only scorn, less, however, than I, who had been her dupe. So then Mr. Rochester sees that this guy is not really um, worthy, and he falls out of love with Celine at that moment, at least according to um, this story he does so he falls out of love with her um, and is, is just annoyed at this whole situation now and he's also annoyed at himself because he was fooled by her duped by her they began to talk their conversation eased me completely frivolous mercenary heartless and senseless it was rather calculated to weary than enrage a listener a card of mine lay on the table this being perceived brought my name under discussion uh, you may have heard the expression, a calling card, so you would leave your calling card. It would basically be like a, a business card, but for social occasions. You'd leave it uh, if you went to visit someone, and then they would know, oh, this person came to visit me, I'll return the visit one day. So that's what they're looking at. This being perceived brought my name under, under discussion. 
Neither of them possessed wit or energy, uh, sorry, possessed energy or wit to belabor me soundly, but they insulted me as coarsely as they could in their little way, especially Selene, who even waxed rather brilliant on my personal defects, deformities, she termed them. Now, it had been her custom to launch out into fervent admiration of what she called my male beauty, wherein she differed diametrically from you, who told me point blank at the second interview that you did not think me handsome. The contrast struck me at the time, and Adele here came running up again. Monsieur, John has just been to say that your agent has called and wishes to see you. Ah, in that case, I must abridge. Um, so Adele interrupts him, um, and Mr. Rochester points out how, uh, Celine would always flatter him and say how handsome he was, unlike Jane, who just point blank tells him that he's ugly. Uh, so he's gonna shorten the story now. In that case, he must abridge. Opening the window, I walked in upon them, liberated Celine from my protection, gave her notice to vacate her hotel, offered her a purse for immediate exigencies, disregarded screams, hysterics, prayers, protestations, convulsions, made an appointment with the Vicomte for a meeting at the Beau de Boulogne. Next morning, I had the pleasure of encountering him, left a bullet in one of his poor, etiolated ed arms, feeble as the wing of a chicken in the pip, and then thought I had done with the whole crew. Um, so he, he reveals himself, he, sa he um, tells Celine that she's free of his protection, he kicks her out of the hotel, gives her some money so that she can kind of get by for a little while. Uh, apparently Celine kind of like throws a fit and she's screaming and crying. Then he challenges that, that Viscount guy to um, a duel and uh, he shoots him in the arm. So you could do this um, in the 1800s if someone really offended you. Uh, you could challenge them to a duel and then you'd fight and whoever won the duel would win the, the argument. Um, not the best way of resolving conflicts, but that's what they did. Um, so he, he shoots him in the arm and then he thought I had done, he, he thinks he had done with the whole crew. But unluckily, the Baron, six months before, had given me this feel at Adele, who she affirmed was my daughter. And perhaps she may be, though I see no proofs of such grim paternity written in her countenance. Pilot is more like me than she. Some years after I had broken with the mother, she abandoned her child and ran away to Italy with a musician or singer. I acknowledge no natural claim on Adele's part to be supported by me, nor do I now not acknowledge any, for I am not her father. But hearing that she was quite destitute, I even took the poor thing out of the slime and mud of Paris, and transplanted it here to grow up clean in the wholesome soil of an English country garden. Mrs. Fairfax found you to train it, but now you know that it is the illegitimate offspring of a French opera girl, you will perhaps think differently of your post and protege. You will be coming to me some day with notice that you have found another place, that you beg me to look out for a new governess, etc. Eh? So Mr. Rochester says, um, six, six months before uh, he broke up with uh, Celine Varens. She had given me this fillet, this little girl, Adele. So Celine Varens tells him that Adele is his daughter. Mr. Rochester is not really so sure, and we can also be pretty unsure because she was uh, in a relationship with this other guy at the same time. So we don't really know who Adele's father uh, is. Uh, it's 1847. You do not have fraternity tests, so there's no way to um, refute or confirm any of these claims. We really don't know if she's Mr. Rochester's daughter or not. Mr. Rochester says that he doesn't think she is his daughter because she doesn't seem to look like him. Um, you know, appearances are not the best judge of who someone's parents are, but that is, that's what he is going with. But even so, he's, he's not sure that um, she's his daughter, but he still takes her in after her mother dies and uh, brings her to England and, and make sure that she's kind of raised um, at Thornfield and with a governess and under the guidance of Mrs. Fairfax. So, I don't know, think, think about how that characterizes him, that action, um, in addition to all of these secrets that he's telling you and his, his scandalous past. But the fact that he takes her in not really knowing if it's his child or not um, says something. So, and then he asks Jane, um, now that you know she's the illegitimate daughter of an opera singer, you're probably gonna leave, right? No, Adele is not answerable for either her mother's faults or yours. I have a regard for her, and now that I know she is, in a sense, parentless, forsaken by her mother and disowned by you, sir, I shall cling closer to her than before. How could I possibly prefer the spoilt pet of a wealthy family, who would hate her governess as a nuisance, to a, little only, to a lonely little orphan who leans towards her as a friend? 
Oh, that is the light in which you will, uh, that is the light in which you view it? Well, I must go in now, and you too, it darkens. So James says, no, I'm not going to leave. Um, Adele has nothing to do with this whole backstory or situation. She's not responsible for any of this. And since she has no mother and since you're disowning her, not claiming her as your child, um, she's she's pretty abandoned. So why would I rather um, work as a governess for someone who's going to be spoiled and, and everyone's favorite when um, I could be with Adele, who kind of sees me as, as a friend and someone she likes? I think that makes a great deal of sense, too, if we think about Jane's own upbringing, where she's an orphan and she's very much disconnected from the remaining family that she has. Um, the Reeds have disowned her, so she kind of knows what, what that feels like. So I think that it kind of makes her um, understand Adele a little bit better and have more sympathy for her. And then Mr. Rochester just says, oh, I gotta go in. But I stayed out a few minutes longer with Adele and Pilot, ran a race with her, and played a game of battle door and shuttlecock. When we went in and I had removed her bonnet and coat, I took her on my knee, kept her there an hour, allowing her to prattle as she liked, not rebuking even some little freedoms and trivialities into which she was apt to stray when much noticed, and which betrayed in her a superficiality of character, inherited probably from her mother, hardly congenial to an English mind. So Jane says she just sits with Adele and lets Adele kind of talk about anything, even if it's kind of frivolous and silly, maybe like what her mom used to talk about. Still, she had her merits, and I was disposed to appreciate all that was good in her to the utmost. I sought in her countenance and features a likeness to Mr. Rochester, but found none. No trait, no turn of expression, announced relationship. It was a pity. If she could but have been proved to resemble him, he would have thought more of her. So, Jane looks at Adele, trying to see some similarities between her and Mr. Rochester. She doesn't, and she feels kind of bad, because if she did in some way resemble him, then Mr. Rochester may have, um cared for her or cared about her and been a little more invested in her future or cared about her more I should say because to take her in he does care about her somewhat it was not till after I had withdrawn to my own chamber for the night that I steadily reviewed the tale Mr. Rochester had told me as he had said there was probably nothing at all extraordinary in the substance of the narrative itself a wealthy Englishman's passion for a French dancer and her treachery to him were everyday matters enough no doubt in society but there was something decidedly strange in the paroxysms of emotion which had suddenly seized him when he was in the act of expressing the present contentment of his mood and his newly revived pleasure in the old hall and its envyings. I meditated wonderingly on this incident, but gradually quitting it, as I found it for the present inexplicable, I turned to the consideration of my master's manner to myself. The confidence he had thought fit to repose in me seemed to tribute to my discretion. I regarded and accepted it as such. His deportment had, now for some weeks, been more uniform t towards me than at first. I never seemed in his way. He did not take fits of chilling hauteur when he met me unexpectedly. The encounter seemed welcome. He had always a word and sometimes a smile for me. When summoned by formal invitation to his presence, I was honored by a cordiality of reception that made me feel I really possessed the power to amuse him, and that these easing conferences were such as might were sought as much for his pleasure as for my benefit. So Mr. Rochester's been acting a little bit more consistently nice um, towards Jane, and she's kind of enjoying that. I, indeed, talked comparatively little, but I heard him talk with relish. It was his nature to be communicative. He liked to open to a mind unacquainted with the world glimpses of its themes and ways. I do not mean its corrupt themes and wicked ways, but such as derive their interest from the great scale on which they were acted, the strange novelty by which they were characterized and I had a keen delight in receiving the new ideas he offered, in imagining the new pictures he portrayed, and following him in thought through the new regions he disclosed, never startled or troubled by one noxious illusion. So, uh, Mr. Rochester just talks about his travels, and he doesn't really talk about anything uh, scandalous aside from this whole opera singer affair that he just mentioned. He just talks about different places and, and different people and situations that he's been in and seen, and Jane enjoys hearing that because... In one sense, uh, Mr. Rochester does have some validity that Jane isn't very well traveled and she hasn't seen too much of the, of the world, at least as far as geography goes. The ease of his manner freed me from painful restraint. The, frank, uh, the friendly frankness, as correct as cordial, with which he treated me, drew me to him. I felt at times as if he were my relation rather than my master, yet he was imperious sometimes still, but I did not mind that. I saw it was his way. 
So happy, so gratified did I become with this new interest added to life that I ceased to pine after, ki after kindred. My thin crescent destiny seemed to enlarge. The blanks of existence were filled up. My bodily health improved. I gathered flesh and strength. So she feels like she can really understand Mr. Rochester and they're getting along very well and she kind of thinks of him um, like, like someone who is very close to her. And was Mr. Rochester now ugly in my eyes? No, reader. Gratitude and many associations, all pleasurable and genial, made his face the object I best liked to see. His presence in a room was more cheering than the brightest fire. Yet I had not forgotten his faults, indeed I could not, for he brought them frequently before me. He was proud, sardonic, harsh to inferiority of every description. In my secret soul, I knew that his great kindness to me was balanced by unjust severity to many others. He was moody, too, unaccountably so. I, more than once, when sent to read for, when sent to, when sent for to read to him, found him sitting in his library alone with his head bent on his folded arms. And when he looked up, a morose, almost a malignant scowl blackened his features. But I believe that his moodiness, his harshness, and his former faults of morality, I say former, for now he seemed corrected of them, had their source in some cruel cross of fate. I believed he was naturally a man of better tendencies, higher principles, and purer taste than such as circumstances had developed, education instilled, or destiny encouraged. I thought there were excellent materials in him, though for the present they hung together somewhat spoiled and tangled. I cannot deny that I grieved for his grief, whatever that was, and would get, have given much to assuage it. Uh, so now Jane doesn't think he's so ugly anymore. She's starting to really enjoy his presence and his company. Um, she still understands that he's got a lot of flaws. He's very sarcastic. He has all of these mood swings. Sometimes he's very upset and angry about something. But Jane seems to think that his, his former wrongdoings and flaws and this like angry moodiness is all from whatever bad experience he's had in the past. Um, and she kind of wishes that she could help him. Uh, so we kind of have two different sections in this chapter. So that's section one. I'm going to make another video with uh, section two.